well, well, well. Well, leave it to you. I, yeah. <laughs> well, Stephen, first of all, thank you very much um, as president of the, the Oxford Union at this time to have sent me this invitation. Do you know I thought it was a hoax when it first arrived? <laughs> and I had to have it checked out that it was for real. Uh, and it certainly was because here I am and it's a joy to be here, a huge privilege to be here. It's a wonderful way for me, a way post my polit political life, um, to be again sort of representing New Zealand. And you may have noticed I'm wearing tonight a camellia brooch. Why do I mention this? <laughs> well, New Zealand is celebrating 125 years of women's enfranchisement. They gained the vote in 1893, the first country in the world to grant women the vote. I will note, I dare say they need some credit, uh, that was passed by men. So thank you, chaps. <laughs> and um, I have been very fortunate uh, during this year of celebration uh, to be able to um, attend many events, been invited to participate in some debates and some panels, reflecting on how far have women come since they gained the vote in um, 1893. And, um, are we there yet, is the question that's asked around um, uh, many of these events that we have. And the answer is no, not really. Um, we've got pay equity issues. I noticed something here in, in um, um, Glasgow today, there was some protest going on about pay equity and things like that. So there are still some issues. Uh, women in leadership roles, women on boards and all of those sorts of things. We still fall short, at least in New Zealand, on that being um, equitable and, and sort of equal. And I don't know if we want to go down the road of quota systems per se. Um, I prefer to think that people got elected on merit as I did <laughs> and, um, in many ways. But so, so, so there's a few things to go. What I find um, humbling about my involvement in our celebrations regarding that is that an, as a trans person, as a transsexual person, um, I have been included. And our diversity and inclusion is important in our country, and it should be important in many countries. Um, human rights is a basis upon which, you know, a lot of these things should be worked out, I think, from time to time. My story is not an easy one, of course. Um, I certainly never planned to get involved in politics at all. Um, I made my transition very young. I was 16 years of age. It was the mid-1970s. The world was quite a different place for rainbow communities in our country at that time. It was illegal to be homosexual then at that time. And, um, and here I was discovering a pathway to be who I had always been, but it had been sort of conditioned out of me. I started displaying transgender behaviour when I was about four or five years of age. This is quite a common thread that you find amongst many transgender people uh, these days. It just didn't, you see, this is never a choice. Who the hell would make a choice uh, to live like that? Uh, knowing the oppressive, the, the hatred sometimes, the bigotry, the discrimination uh, that comes with a decision like that. Um, so, no, I don't believe it to be a choice. And can I just say at this point, hearing the news out of the White House yesterday, the Trump administration intends to erase the fact that transgender exists, um, or they're suggesting that they want to do that. To stand in solidarity with my um, American transgender family, we will not be erased. I certainly can't be erased. I'm a piece of history. It's real, Donald, and you're not going to change it. That is why I want, I want America to know. And I'll stick my neck out and speak on behalf of the transgender communities of New Zealand and so I say, and, and may I say, we stand in solidarity with you. I want you to know that there are those of us who are far away from the United States who feel for you right now. 
and uh, can only hope that you take some sustenance from the fact that there are people out there who will support you from afar. That's all I need to say about that. And Donald, when I'm passing back through LA on my way home, don't stop me at the border. Um, <laughs> you know, do we not want people to be positive participants in our society? When people are such that they pose no personal threat to you alone, except maybe to your moral compass and your moral values, but actually cause no particular harm to you. It was a bit of the same argument over same-sex marriage and all of that. What the hell does it matter to you, really? How does it affect you? And what I say to you is, get your head out of my crotch, please. Stop stopping and thinking about people like me at that point. So as a young transitioning transsexual um, in New Zealand, I had no idea of the kind of abyss I was diving into. Not at all. <laughs> And I thought that I could go, I wanted to be a, a performer, an entertainer, an actor. And um, I went to a sort of great lengths in my early life. I'll tell you why, actually. <laughs> it was the only way I could get away with dressing up and putting on makeup without being acceptable. And um, <laughs> when you're acting in a play on stage, uh, a deceitful way of going about trying to be who I actually was and for it to be acceptable. And um, and when I left school and I went to go to Wellington to sign up to our New Zealand drama school at that time, I was way too young. I was 16 going on 17 and that certainly wasn't going to happen. Um, I was still in butch at that point and it wasn't until I had been taken by some friends, but some of my part-time work I was doing was as a night porter at one of our hotels in Wellington and other staff members in that particular hotel who happened to be gay, um, um, I ended up flatting with these guys. And one of them, Rion, took me to a, um, a drag uh, cabaret show called The Balcony, owned by a fabulous um, uh, transgender icon in New Zealand called Madame Carmen. And she owned this establishment, and it was the first time I had ever gone in to anywhere like that, and then saw these fabulous looking women on stage. And they had all the right equipment, you know, as far as I could tell. It wasn't really until they opened their mouths that I sort of thought, oh, okay, oh, right, are you? And I immediately saw a pathway to becoming a woman as best as I could. Um, and so it started, I never looked back, and like I said, dived into an abyss that I had no idea of the consequences, the social consequences that were going to happen to me. It ended up, there was institutional discrimination. Um, I couldn't get employment uh, as a transgender person at that time unless I was going to be the man they thought I should be. And with our institutional discrimination, particularly with our social welfare system at the time, um, I couldn't get a job, so I wanted to sign up for the unemployment benefit. And I got told, well, you go and put your trousers back on and get out there and get a job, otherwise, net, you're getting nothing, um, as far as that's concerned. I don't know where it came from, but at that point, I just drew a line in the sand, and I said, no, this is who I am, and if this is the way you intend to treat me, um, then I just have to live with that at that time. And um, so stuff you. And um, I didn't capitulate uh, to that kind of discrimination. And so where did I end up? Working in the sex industry. From the first client I ever had to the last, I hated every single minute of it. I had been brought up relative, relatively well educated. I had been from a middle class family. It wasn't as if I was terribly deprived as a child financially and security wise and all of that sort of thing. Um, I did have a few clues between my head. I had potential and I wanted to reach that potential. But then this barrier as a trans person came up against me and, and not just me, many others like me. And the sex industry can be, in one sense, a very secure place with your fellow sex workers and other trans people who are working in it and the gay community, but we existed in a twilight world. 
and um, we were constantly in danger um, from the outside world, um, who oddly enough came to do the sort of, you know, the first 15 rugby team would be playing their matches and suddenly they want to go and do the, you know, go and look at the queers down on Vivian Street in Wellington and that kind of thing. And then the next thing you know, they've come into the clubs and then the next thing you know, they've had a bit too much to drink or other stuff or whatever like that. And the next thing you know, they're getting all horny. And the next thing you know, they've had an encounter. Uh, but don't tell my mates. You know, hypocrisy. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this, you know, um, happened a lot. The brutality of it, clients sometimes could be cruel, numerous times slapped around, knives to the throat, all of that kind of thing, just to conduct a bit of business so I could make some money to pay my bloody rent, put clothes on my back and put food on the table, um, you know, and all of that kind of thing. I didn't know how to get out of it. My contemporaries in the same scene at the time tended to want to keep you down there with them. I always had aspirations to do more. I still wanted to do acting and all of those sorts of things, but now I didn't know how that was going to happen, being who and what I was, you know, at that time. But eventually, after about five years, I did manage to crawl out of it. And um, I did start to do what I call legitimate work. Yes, it was in a gay nightclub in Auckland, and yes, it was on a drag show, but I wasn't having to sell my ass to make my butter, bread and butter money, if you know what I mean. Much more preferable to, um, you know, be it oddly enough, of course. <laughs> um, we're filming this, aren't we? I can't really use this kind of language. Oh, it's but, fine. Um, <laughs> you know. There's, there's, lo there's lots of stuff on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, well, to sell my ass to get my money maker, can I put it that way? <laughs> it's a bit more uh, um, broadcastable. Um, and that way um, was terrible. And the fact that one had to do that kind of thing to achieve the reassignment surgery that you required is really wrong. Really wrong. Um, that you were forced to do it that way. Uh, all, not all of us, of course, but some of us. Our health system at that time certainly didn't accommodate um, reassignment surgeries. They do, it does now, but it's very inadequate. It simply isn't good enough. And there's a lot of activism going along on at the moment about um, addressing those issues. And not just in New Zealand, but you know, quite you know, many countries around the world for our trans community, our rainbow communities. Anyhow, um, in 1979, um, I've been working in a strip club and a friend of, and it closed, um, uh, clo or it changed ownership actually, and um, we, uh, me and a friend of mine uh, took an, that opportunity to go and check out Sydney and Australia and see if we can sort of wrench ourselves out of having to be in the sex industry and go over there and, you know, and, and, and get some kind of ordinary job. And, and we did. Um, and uh, I worked in a, in a bar and I was getting legitimate paid, the first legitimate job that I ever had. Um, we'd only been there about two or three months and I ended up being pack raped by four men. And just as I thought I was starting to go on a gentle climb out of the mire of what I'd come from and, and go on, this took me back to rock bottom again. It was brutal, it was nasty. And the most disturbing thing about it was I could get no redress. There was no justice for me. Slap a bloody prostitute drag queen Maori from New Zealand. <laughs> Raped. You asked for it. It's that kind of thing. There was no justice going to be happening for me. I tried to commit suicide three times after that event. I felt like I was the shit on the bottom of everybody's shoe. That's the way I was made to feel. There was going to be no future for me. Uh, what the hell am I living this hell for? And, um, but I didn't want to stop being Georgina. It didn't drive me away from doing that. Fortunately for me, because it's a fine line between it crushing you entirely. But I got angry about it. I got a fire in my belly, and not just selfishly about 
what I had just endured, that anybody who ever had to endure something like that deserves recognition uh, for the injustice of that, including a transgender person like me. And so I thought, how do I go about presenting a different persona, I guess, of how people thought about someone who was transsexual? Well, I can only try and set an example. And I went out, I managed to get involved in television. I made one of the first films in New Zealand with a transgender theme through it. It was about a transsexual and a transvestite in a plutonic relationship. There was no sex in it, no nothing. It was just a simple story about a day in their life. Colourful as it was, interesting as it was, but it presented transgender characters in a far more realistic way than the caricatures that we often saw, all the Danny LaRue's of this world and all of that who were really drag artists as opposed to being transgender. And... Um, but that's how people often saw us. We were targets of mockery when we were presented in the media and all of that sort of thing. But this particular little short film called Jules Dahl, um, part of a big drama series that was going to go on our New Zealand television in a prime time slot on Sunday evenings. And uh, Jules Dahl was one of six dramas that were made in a series called About Face. So all... Uh, particular episodes were in the can and they were different stories. Jules Dahl was just but one. And um, the censor of the day delayed the screening of the series because of Jules Dahl, because that censor determined that the um, content of the film was contrary to the public's good taste. Who the hell was he to judge? And the irony about that is when, it, when the series did finally go to air, Jules Dahl earned five nominations for writing, directing, da 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 da, -da and, on of it, and one of them was for Best Actress. And I was the finalist for Best Actress in the 1987 New Zealand Film and Television Awards. And I didn't win. It was won by another fabulous New Zealand actress called Jennifer Ward Leyland, who was in a programme from the same series. No problem with that. What I won was the fact that my peers in the industry at that time gave me the dignity of nominating me as a best actress in the gender to which I identified. And so acceptance started. Well, in that particular clique of the entertainment and film industry in New Zealand at that time, I didn't need to win the trophy. <laughs> that was winning enough that I had started to step into the mainstream world, if you like, like that. I made several other television things. Yes, I got typecast playing transgender roles, transgender rape victims. Hell, I didn't need to go and do much studying for that, did I? I'd already had that experience. So what you saw on the screen was very, very real. <laughs> you know, not a lot of acting required, actually. And, um, excuse me while I just wet the whistle. And so when people started to see someone like me in their living rooms, it made a big difference. It starts to desensitise many things. Um, as far as, ooh, queers, ooh. I mean, it's still probably there, but the more you become familiar with it, um, the less it seems threatening, one hopes. And um, by the 19, end of the 1980s, I'd had enough of doing um, the drag show at Alfie's Nightclub in Auckland. Um, creatively, it actually wasn't doing it for me anymore. <laughs> because we did lip syncing. And there's nothing worse than putting out a fabulously passionate expo uh, you know, um, performance, but it stops. <clears throat> you can't. 
get it out. You can't sing it, because I've got a lousy voice, actually. But um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to, but I was a great performer of the Whitney Houston's and the Jennifer Holiday songs. I, I was the drag diva that did all of those ones in our show, which was a very popular show in those days. So I was over that. That had been the better part of the 80s for me, was doing that. But at least it was legitimate work, you know? I always had that in the back of my mind. Um, it was entertainment, I enjoyed that, and, um, and I was making an honest dollar out of it. And I, you know, it was very good about that. So I left Auckland, I moved back to Wellington, which is my hometown, capital city of New Zealand, and um, I found myself in a rural area called the Wairarapa. It is a rural area about 80 to 100 k's northeast of Wellington City. And I found myself in a little town called Carterton. And I signed up to a government funded training scheme called a TOPS course, um, Training Opportunities Program. And it had a drama component on it. I thought, oh, yes, that, that'll be, I, I could do that, <laughs> um, amongst other things. And it was a life skills course, yeah, like I needed life skills. I already had quite a few <laughs> by that time. And after I had done that 20-week course, oh, and the reason why I wanted to take up a course like that was I thought I had better start to get myself a bit more educated and some more realistic kind of employment than what I had been working in in the previous 10 years or so. And um, so that was sort of the motive behind doing that. After my 20-week course finished, I then got asked to teach the drama component on the course. Well, I'm not a qualified teacher or anything, but I certainly knew a bit about drama and acting. And, um, and I had a mentor by the name of uh, George Webby, who had worked at our New Zealand drama school as a teacher. And so he had given me a lot of his resources and would be there for advice if I needed it while I'm taking these unemployed students um, through a program. And the point of having a drama component was, and I, you know what we got around, they were all unemployed, um, down and out young people. Um, and we used to, I used to, um, and, you know, get them to um, create a show that we would put on at the end of it. And I wanted it to be a show that expressed their view of the world at the time. And uh, it came out with some great stuff. And people who, you know, guys particularly, oh, I'm not doing the bloody acting stuff, bloody poofters. You know, oh, God, not doing that. And you know what? At the end of the day, they produce some of the best stuff. They would either write it or do music or something like that in an area that they were, you know, interested in. And they suddenly found that being able to express their frustration with their lives, with the state of where they're at at that time was very fulfilling. And, um, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. And so that was good. That was a good thing, you know, to do. And I felt good because I now I was doing, it, you know, in this kind of teacher role. And I didn't think I could ever do anything like that. And because our course ran out of the local community centre, I became involved with the business of the community centre. In 1991 in New Zealand, we had what is dubbed or affectionately called the mother of all budgets. The then finance minister, um, a lady by the name of Ruth Richardson in New Zealand of the National Party, that's the right centre-right party in New Zealand, and um, she delivered a very savage budget for, particularly for low-income and beneficiaries that wiped about 25% off the benefits like that. And I would claim that the result of that we are still feeling in New Zealand today. It was devastating for some of the most vulnerable in our community. And now we have this intergenerational dependency and cycle of abuse and all sorts of things at that low level. It had an effect even in a small town like Carterton, where we had a bit of homelessness suddenly popped up about six months down the track from when that um, that was uh, implemented, that particular budget. And um, so we as a community centre wanted to do our do good a bit and help out with that. 
uh, we had been donated a caravan to, um, um, by somebody uh, so that we could have very temporary accommodation for the odd person that was found homeless while we sorted out uh, their proper entitlements, etc., uh, with the welfare system and got them into something more appropriate rather than being in a caravan. But we had this caravan, so that was a resource that was handy for us. We had Red Cross to help us with blankets and food and all of that sort of thing, and some other community organisations, churches, Salvation Army and that, who were quite happy to help our little initiative in this regard. What we did was we went to the local district council and asked them if they would uh, donate to us, uh, free of charge, a powered caravan site at the council-owned caravan park. And their response was no. That is a central government issue. We don't deal with social housing in that regard, was sort of the um, impression going on at the time. We only wanted a powered caravan site, hopefully for a very temporary period of time, while we dealt with the social issue. What I'm getting at here is all of a sudden, without knowing it, because I kept getting pushed forward to be the mouthpiece when we made submissions to council and stuff like that, and, um, Obviously, I seem to have acquitted myself quite well, they thought, because 1992 election came around uh, for local government, so new mayors, new councillors, and all of that sort of thing, and some bright spark came up with the idea, Stephen, that I should uh, run for the local council. And I said, are you kidding me? What the hell do they do? You know, exactly other than what they won't do, which I didn't know, uh, you know, know about. And, um, and I said, well, actually, wouldn't it actually be a good platform to run in this election to just air some issues. I wouldn't have a chance in hell of ever getting anywhere, but let's use the vehicle um, to talk about some social issues that we as a community centre have been dealing with. And so um, I ran on a ticket, would you believe, with a retired vicar, the Reverend William Woodley Hartley, God rest his soul, he's passed away now. And uh, of course, lots of actress and bishop jokes went on and all of that kind of thing. And we had fun, but we got our sort of message out there. Don't forget I'd only moved to this place in 1990. Now we're talking 1992, and I'm having a go at the holy cow called the local council, which had been occupied, the seats around there with intergenerational, you know, generations of the same family names that are all our streets are named after us. <laughs> Sitting there, there was this sort of, you know, element about it that was uh, um, very, very conservative and stuck in its ways, I suppose. And I suddenly came along like a breath of fresh air and sort of was saying things like, well, do you really want to have all these old farts sitting around making the same old decisions all the time? Nothing ever changes, everything moves slowly and all of that. And people are sitting there going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, anyhow, I missed out on being successful in that election. I missed out by 14 votes. Not bad for a first run for this tranny from nowhere turning up in town only a year or two beforehand. Not bad, I thought, and I was very happy and satisfied with my first shot at it. However, after that election, one of the newly elected councillors, happened to be the Baptist minister, um, had to uh, resign his seat because he got redeployed in his ministry uh, to another city. And so I think he might have attended one meeting, the um, inaugural meeting, and that was it. So suddenly there was a vacancy in the urban ward. And um, that is the ward that I had run in. And I'd only missed out by 14 votes. And although it isn't law, it is usually convention that the next highest polling candidate, so soon anyhow after an election, would just be appointed. But the council made a decision to go for a by-election. And that by-election was sort of controversial because everyone was sort of saying, so you're going to go and blow God knows how many thousands of dollars when you could have just appointed Georgina. She only missed out by 14 votes, but I don't know. And to put it in some context, very small district, population about 7,000, um, and not all of them are ratepayers, and about $25,000 in those days constituted about 1% of rates, and the council was prepared to go and blow about $15,000 to run a by-election. And so uh, that made many constituents in that ward 
very angry. And not only that, the whole district very angry that they were going to sort of spend unnecessary money on running this by-election. Why? Of course, they were perfectly entitled. There were only three choices the council had. Leave the seat vacant. That wasn't really a choice. It was only a matter of um, months after the actual election. And so you couldn't leave someone unrepresented. Um, you could appoint, but they chose not to, and then of course run a by-election. And that's what they chose to do, and of course shoulders were tapped to go and stand against me, and there were about four candidates uh, stood against me. They all shared half the vote, and I got the rest. <laughs> and so they kicked my butt into that council and gave the finger to the council at the same time, saying, we weren't happy with your decision, so here, you got her anyhow, because they didn't want this queer thing sitting at the table. Really? It would sort of have some... Boy, do they regret that now. <laughs> In some respects. I took my duties uh, very seriously as a councillor. I had to learn on the job, and I did. I was the first Māori to have ever been elected to that council. And we had a thing called the Resource Management Act had just been um, uh, implemented uh, from central government at that time, and now councils were required to um, provide their policies and things around that uh, particular act of parliament. One of them was to set up a consultative procedure with your local iwi, in other words, your local Māori tribe. And um, what did they do? They turned to the first and only brown face they'd ever had sitting at the table, believing that I must be steamed and tikanga Māori and spoke fluent te reo Māori and all of that sort of thing. Sorry, I was brought up Pākehāwhāi, as we call it over there, very Europeanised. I might have known a few words like kia ora, which is hello, and all of that sort of thing, but that was about the extent of it. But you know what? I seized the opportunity to be the one to rush off and come up with some draft proposal for the policy the council might um, adopt. I saw it as my chance to grab a bit of credibility here because it was very easy to be shut down as a new member, not really wanted at the table, and so shut out from, uh, from the power brokers and things around the table. And I found it difficult, because I'm trying to learn on the job how this works, and I didn't really understand how politics works, and it can be a very dirty, grubby, nasty game. As I've since come to learn, and now know how to do it too. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I went off and I you know, came back with a bit of a draft policy, um, uh, other than a few amendments here and there, after we had consulted with our local iwi about it and all of that, it got implemented. It, it became um, council policy. And, um, and like many pieces of uh, uh, legislation that you might do, it does need to move with the times and alter. So I had sort of nailed it as my first opportunity to show that actually, yeah, okay, she's got some potential here. And I was gradually allowed into the fold to be able to share properly the governance uh, responsibilities of our district. I'd only been in the job two and a half years as a councillor and some very naughty manager, <laughs> and the council came up to me and said, 1995, local body elections are coming around again, you should run for the mayoralty. I said, you have got to be kidding. I said, really? Oh boy, I'm really exposing myself out there. He said, no, 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 what I'm hearing out there, you're popular, you're good, they like you. And I didn't know whether to believe it or not, or whether I was, I, I was being um, set up. Um, in our country, I'm not sure what it's like here, you can run um, as for the mayoralty and as a councillor. Um, if you win being a councillor but miss out on the mayoralty, then, then that's fine. If you win the mayoralty, then that's what you become. Uh, so, you could, so you've got two chances, really, um, of winning election uh, at some level. Um, and there. I ran for both. Uh, I, I thought, well, I done a term as a councillor, so they might put me back in as a councillor quite happily, but mayoralty, oh, that's different. Number one citizen, leader of the area, um, you know, and all of that. And the mayor, of course, is, has no particular powers in New Zealand other than the fact that the mayor is elected at large, whereas the council are elected by wards. And so you have the general approval when you're elected as mayor from the whole electorate uh, that they want you for the mayoralty. 
um, I won with a very good majority um, the mayoralty election that year, and all of a sudden there it was. And do you know when I got the results, I'm sitting there at home waiting for the phone call to come through from the um, electoral <coughs> officer um, who's going to give the results and all of those things. And, um, oh, congratulations, Your Worship, you are now the Mayor of Carterton. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Okay, I, 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 it just took a moment to drink that in, and I put the phone down, and I sat there as it descended upon me, and you know what I said to myself? And what the hell do I do now? <laughs> oh, boy, you have really jumped into it. But I took to the roll like a duck to water. I loved it. And I gave it a different flavour from what they had been used to in Carterton. I was now um, getting some profile now because of my uniqueness as a transsexual. And, um, and sort of wondering if I'd put something in the water to make people vote for me or something, but no. It's all about being genuine and upfront and telling the truth. And if you don't know something, say so. Don't dance on the head of a pin trying to, you know, you just got to be straight up. And also, because it was a small district, small population, I could just about get to know every single person who lived there. And I did. Um, and, um, you know, I started to do things in that leadership role, as well as all the solemn, you know, Anzac days and all of those things, VIPs coming to town. Well, I just liken that to how you might do it in, you know, in a performance. You know, there's a certain dignity that you have to show. You are representative and therefore, you know, you need to have a certain what we call in Māori terms, mana. Um, and, uh, you know, about it because you are on that representative thing. Um, and for the ceremonials and the ribbon cuttings and all of that kind of stuff, but there's actually other work to do. The idea is, is that, and I prefer participatory democracy, I prefer my uh, constituents uh, to not feel that, it, that council is a sort of a barrier. Mention the word submission and they all reel in horror. Oh my God, a submission, what the hell is that? And I made an example of it. Um, of how easy and how it is that anyone, no matter how young or old, um, can participate in our local district council business because this is your area. And so I need you to feel free to engage with us. A nine-year-old boy wrote a letter to the council one day um, saying that he had, um, halfway down their road was sealed, tar sealed. The rest of it was still a metal road. And the houses were at the end of that metal road area. Um, it was just a little cluster of houses. And the school bus wouldn't go down beyond the sealed part. And, and the houses were about a kilometre on. So the poor boy had to leave his bike on the side of the road because the bus would only go to the sealed bit. And in the winter time it was muddy and horror. In the summer time it was, you know, all of the sad sack story came through. And I thought, yeah, I can just see mum and dad's hand all over this. Um, <laughs> but I like it. I like it. This young boy, or under his name, you know, he had written to me. And so I rang up the parents and I sort of said, love your son's submission. I would love him to come to council and do an oral submission. <gasps> oh, Sean, what the hell is that? Um, I said, all I want him to do is to come and read his letter. And I said, that is an oral submission. Oh, is it that easy? I went, yep, yep, it's that easy. So the boy dutifully came along with his parents on that particular council night, and he presented his um, uh, submission, his oral submission, and um, I just happened to have called up the local Dominion newspaper and a couple of others to come along and get a photo of this. The point being, is I wanted to show a young person practising democracy from a constituent's point of view. And other similar things I did, this is to engage young people. I would ask my local schools, we had five of them, and um, that their senior classes, when they come to a point where they might be studying parliament and the council and things like that, civics I guess you'd call it, I asked if they would um, do a little exercise for me. Uh, get a group of them to elect themselves a mayor and a council. So go through the democratic process at school and then to, um, once they've done that, to um, arrange an agenda that, for a meeting that they might have. And once they've got that, I want them to come down to the council chamber 
and uh, conduct that meeting. And I'll play the ratepayer, <laughs> and um, we'll go through the investiture, investiture process for the mayor, so that's the chain and everything and the oath of office and all of that sort of stuff. Role playing, I guess I'm talking about, making it very real for them. And the mayoral chain, they could see it, touch it, look at it, and see that all the little um, bits and bobs on it were the names of many of the streets in our, in our town and, and district. And they could suddenly identify it with a bit of history about what this council thing is all about. And then afterward, they'd had their meeting, and I played vexatious, um, <laughs> the vexatious ratepayer, of which there are many, and um, <laughs> and, um, and and that was all very very well, and they handled it very well. But the best part for them was the um, biscuits and cordial afterwards, you know, that we would have, just like they do at council meetings. You know, they have their little tot of something and a bit of club sandwiches and things like that around when they've conducted their, finished their meeting. So the kids should enjoy that too, uh, to an extent. Did I get a flea in the ear from many parents? What the hell have you been telling our children? By God, they can't stop talking about the council, this and the mayor, that, and do you know that that street was named after blah, 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 blah. Some of these kids were more informed than their parents ever had been. And so what we had begun was a curiosity for them and, and a bit of an understanding. And so that's why I think teaching people who are going to be our future, much like yourselves, um, is an important thing to engage and not be afraid of and to, yes, take risks sometimes, but there's no harm in doing that. After my time in uh, the mayoralty and I got re-elected again in 1998 with a 90% majority, so I really had very good support. The New Zealand Labour Party in 1998 came and shoulder tapped me to consider running as a Labour candidate for the seat of Wairarapa, of which Carterton, my town and district, was a part. The seventh largest general seat in the country it was at the time, usually a um, national party stronghold. Most often, I think Labour had only held that seat three times in the seat's history, but it was a stronghold for the national party who were really the party for rural New Zealanders, as they sort of, you know, blue seats and all of that kind of stuff. And um, I turned them down three times. I already had a job I loved. And I thought I was extraordinarily fortunate that as a person of difference, I was even in this position. And, um, and I didn't want to lose it because I might have some ego thing about, ooh, Parliament, you know, um, and that was a whole different ball game. I'd had to engage with Parliament as a mayor, and, you know, from time to time, I sort of liked about that distance, <laughs> that was great, and um, I don't believe in party politics around a district council table, actually, I find it to be more of a hindrance than a help. Aren't we there to have governance and do the best we can for our district? And so I used to work on the basis of trying to, I never wanted to use my vote, and I didn't have to use it very often at all because I preferred consensus to win out over at the end of the day when we were making important decisions in council. But anyhow, here I had this approach to run for the New Zealand Labour Party. I even had a meeting with um, our former Prime Minister, uh, uh, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, uh, prior to the 99 election. She was the leader of the opposition, the Labour Party at that time, and I had a brief meeting with her and she was very keen for me to um, take up the offer and stuff like that. And then she said, Why one line that made me think, oh God. Um, she said, yes, we're looking for star performers, Georgina. And I thought, oh, okay. So I've acquitted myself okay and become popular as the mayor of Carterton. I'm a person of difference, and this is where I think some of this identity politics started to come into. I took the box, I'm Māori. I took the box, I'm of a diverse gender. I tick the box because that diverse gender happens to be of woman. Māori, diverse woman. And, um, and that would sort of fit the image of being a broad church and that kind of thing. I cynically thought that. Perhaps I was wrong at the end of the day, but um, nevertheless, I wasn't impressed by that. But I capitulated at the end of the day and thought, well, if I don't get into Parliament, I still have my mayoralty <laughs> uh, there, and perhaps I will get turfed out of that mayoralty at the very next election, um, but 
I'm also a bit of an opportunist. You've got to take a chance when it comes along. And Parliament was sort of beckoning. And the wind of change was coming through the country that we were going to have a change of government and it would be a Labour-led government. And that's precisely what happened. In the 1999 general election, I won the seat of Wairarapa. It was the largest swing in the country for any electorate at that time. 32% swing to Labour. I won the seat with a 3,000 majority. The previous MP for Wairarapa had held an 8,000 majority. I thought that wasn't bad. We also won the party vote. We have a mixed member proportional representation system of uh, um, election in our country. So it's a proportional representation. We have two votes. One for the party you most want in Parliament and the other is for the constituency MP uh, you most want in Parliament. They don't necessarily have to come from the same party. Um, you could you know, vote one party with your party vote, you can vote the constituency with another because that particular MP or, um, might be very good at his job no matter what party that they're in. Um, so that's the way our current um, electoral system works in New Zealand. Not universally enjoyed by everybody, and that's usually the ones who like first past the post. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. We turned to an MMP environment in 1996, was our first MMP election. We'd held an, a referendum in 1993, um, which the country made that decision to have a proportional representation system, and MMP was it. So 1999, I find myself in Parliament. I am gobsmacked. Again, I'm sitting on the phone going, and what the hell do I do now? <laughs> um, my uh, Carterton district, very disappointed that they were going to lose me as their mayor, but I said, hey, you've gained me as your MP. It's not like I'm not going to be representing you in some um, you know, form again. And with those two elections, as mayor and as um, a member of parliament, a constituency member of parliament, I was crowned, I guess, by the media to begin with, that I was the first transsexual in the world to have ever been elected to either of those positions. I didn't believe it. I felt surely there must have been somebody else, and how do you prove such a thing? But no hands went flying into the air. I modified that a little bit later at a United Nations conference in Montreal, where I said, actually, I'm going to say that I am the world's first out transsexual that has ever been elected into this office. How the hell would I know that somebody who could never be out hadn't been elected? Just to pay some dignity and homage to that possibility. And I can't claim it. I'm not so big-headed and egotistical to think, oh, yes, you do, oh, wow, you know, and all of that kind of thing. Um, you know, get a bit real about it, and it keeps me a bit grounded too. Um, Parliament uh, was a very interesting place. Once I'd got my head around the resources at your fingertips, um, some of the things you can do um, and help to affect change. So I had worked at a more micro level in local government and now the world was opening up. But nobody gives you the handbook on how to do this stuff. Nobody particularly mentored me on how I was going to navigate my way through parliament and politics. I didn't understand the dynamics of how some of that works, and it can be nasty. And um, then some issues came along in our first term that I had to be involved with. And one was Civil Union Act, and the other was prostitution reform. How many people in their lives, having endured some of the stuff I had in my earlier life, get a chance to change it? To make life better and more reasonable and actually to regulate, I guess, prostitution reform. It does, you know, the disinfectant of light upon something like that really rocks and rolls the criminal elements that used to contain it to provide human rights and protections for the sex workers. It is about health, most certainly, and it's about safety and all of those things. It's about looking in the mirror and saying, huh, who do you think accesses the services of somebody in prostitution? It's your husband, it's your father, it's your um, brother, it's your nephew, it's, uh, and not all men, I might say, as it is. But who do you think? 
If you're going to go around thinking, oh, it's just the deviant plastic map a brigade, think again. No, it's not. And with the dangers of sexually transmitted diseases, and certainly with the um, HIV and AIDS being around, there were innocent people being infected because of errant goings-ons, you know, in an unprotected, unregulated, um, and all you got was... Um, and where is the justice, actually, that the sex worker got criminalised, the client walked away scot-free? What the hell is that about? That's misogyny, I would have thought. And, um, and again, an exploitation of more vulnerable people who happen to get caught up in that industry. So here we've had, and can I please give credit right now to the woman who began all of that um, uh, reform for us in New Zealand. She has recently, in our last Queen's Birthdays Honours, been made a dame, Dame Catherine Healy, who has spoken at this very institution to debate prostitution reform. And if Catherine had ever thought that she would be acknowledged by our country and made a dame, she would never have thought that would have 30 years she had fought for reform. And when our government came in and she found um, my colleague Tim Barnett uh, to be the sponsor of the prostitution reform, it, oh, don't get me wrong, it was a venal, vile, divisive debate that not only happened in Parliament but around the country. It was dreadful. Uh, but it came through to be the right thing to do at the end. Now, many, it was a world-leading piece, uh, world piece of legislation when it happened. There were many countries that thought, what the hell? And, um, and then there's been a few others who have sort of tried to follow suit with um, doing the same thing. It is a responsible thing to bring something like that out into the light, to regulate it, to make it safe if it's going to occur. Why do they call it the oldest profession in the world? Because it ain't going nowhere, honey. And, um, and now we have issues about sex trafficking, people trafficking, and all of that. And if you haven't got your just prostitution sorted yet, as far as accepting or not accepting that actually it does exist, we better be responsible about how we deal with it, rather than being blissfully ignorant about it and allowing it continue. It, it, it's, it's not good. I defend prostitution reform. Many denounce it. And, uh, but I think it's a better way to go. Civil unions, another venal, vis um, divisive debate. Hadn't heard anything like it since we had had homosexual law reform in 1986. And the campaign for that prior to the 86 vote and, and all of that sort of thing was horrible. It was dehumanising, frankly, is what it was. And here we were again with civil unions in, um, you know, in the early 2000s, and again um, the haters were coming out of the closet and, um, and airing their views, and in particular um, fundamental Christian organisations, and one in particular in New Zealand, the Destiny Church, held a very large march against it um, and all of that in Parliament, and it was very nasty. And when you get ordinary citizens um, who are watching this march coming through the main streets of Wellington heading to Parliament in Roman formation, in a sort of black uniformy thing, punching the air like this, enough is enough. Ordinary workers in the Wellington CBD were horrified because the imagery that they were seeing was so Nazi Germany. And I stood on the steps of our parliament with a rainbow flag just to stare them down as they looked like a cancer spreading across our forecourt of parliament and stuff like that, just to, you know, say, I'm here, Brian, you're there, and, uh, you know, and that kind of thing, um, uh, just as a protest. And our supporters for civil unions, of which there were about 150 during that protest, all stuck around. We had this statue of Richard John Seddon, one of our former prime ministers, historic prime ministers, um, on, in the front lawn of our parliament. And they were crushed in around the statue, our supporters, um, by the 8,000 that had turned out for the protest from this Destiny Church thing. It was horrible. And they were being abused like you wouldn't believe. And they were terrified. They were scared as hell hell. And there I am standing on the steps where they couldn't actually get to me, um, you know, because I was behind the security barrier, but I wanted them to know, you know, I'm sort of there, that kind of thing, just to steer them down. Um, when their rally finished, 
I was compelled to go down to our supporters who were caught in, in this horrible situation. And I went to go down there and they abused me just the same as they abused them. And um, my um, friend Ramon at the time um, said, you've got to come back behind the security barrier. You're gonna, this is not good, this is not good. But I managed to have a little word with our supporters and then I went back up behind the forecourt and there's a famous piece of footage of me marching angry across the front of the forecourt yelling because I didn't have a sound system. They had a sound system the Rolling Stones would have been proud of. And I'm shouting back at them, why do you hate us so much? What the hell are you teaching your children? Because there were children. There were over a hundred children in front, in the front of the march of 8,000 people. And they exploited their children like that um, to make a point. And um, I don't know if that's good or not. I don't think it is, but um, not to use children in that regard. Um, you've got to be very careful when you put children into a protest thing. And something like that, which was about um, denying the basic right of two adult consenting people to marry or to have a civil union. What the hell is that? That is discrimination to the nth degree. Why? Because in your head you're thinking, oh, butt-fucking. Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you think it's all about? Well, no, it's not. It's about having positive participants in our society and equality under the law to be able to love. To be able to love somebody and to anchor that love with a solemnity of some kind of war marriage we would have liked at that time, but it was politically not going to happen. We called it civil unions instead. <laughs> and the, uh, the protesters against us would say, but that's just marriage by another name. And we're going, yes, actually it is. But, um, <laughs> but, but you know... Um, Remarkable, really, to think that there was all that angst. It came to pass, and it passed with a reasonable majority of over 10, I think, in the Parliament at that time, quite different to prostitution reform. It, prostitution reform passed by the thinnest, if you can even call it that, majority. Actually, it passed because of an abstention. One abstention. And that's why prostitution reform passed. We're well over 10 or 11 years later down the track. It hasn't been repealed. In fact, if any, and it does get reviewed, prostitution reform I'm talking about. And, um, and it needs to move with the new dynamics as things go on. Like I'm saying, immigration issues regarding sex work and all of that kind of thing. Um, there are new dynamics happening around and all of that sort of thing. Um, I'll come to a conclusion shortly, Stephen, so we can get into a good Q&A session. I've been a very fortunate person, very fortunate New Zealander. I couldn't be more proud of the country, I'm sorry, for providing the opportunity for me to be a fully participatory citizen in my country. I thank New Zealand for that. how much different my life would have been if out of some of my own initiative but because of the honesty of some New Zealanders especially in the electorates that I represented that I they could look beyond my colourful past and see the worthiness in me and then give me their support to be their representative you, money can't buy that stuff I tell you, I could never be more honoured to have served them. My constituency, my country, a wonderful thing. And with my election to those public positions, the inspiration it set out to other minorities, to other transgender people around the world, I'm not the first one to have had a go at public office, I can tell you that. 
There have been many others, they just never quite made it. I just happened to be the first one that made it. But boy, did that send a clear message to many others around the world. Not long after I got elected to um, the New Zealand Parliament, a couple of years actually, the Italian Parliament had its first out transsexual member of Parliament. Her name was Vladimir Luxuria, and uh, she sadly uh, served in a very short-lived Prodi government at the time. And then after that, a lady called Anna, I apologise, I cannot remember her surname, was elected to the Polish Parliament, and I think she may well still be serving, but for a period of time after I had retired from Parliament, after Vladimir was no longer in Parliament, she was the only transsexual in the world uh, to be still serving in a Parliament. We have other transgender people around the world who have been elected to public office, perhaps not into their Parliaments or whatever, but onto various boards and things like that, and into local government. Transgender people around the world are as diverse in their intelligence and their abilities and everything they are working in every kind of ish area from entertainment one thing, television being another. They are doctors, they are surgeons, they are architects, they are all sorts of people um, who are doing amazing things and who have a right to be able to make those contributions to our societies around the world. Diversity is something not to be afraid of and I think people are afraid of it. And I have to say, and it's going to offend some people, but I do blame a lot of the moral compass that people have had to follow, the moral compass that have been imbued upon us from birth to religion. And some of what's said in the Bible, they always quote Leviticus and all of that. You know, it almost countermands the whole point of the faith and the religion and the goodness when they pick on a vulnerable minority like they do. So people, look beyond that, please. What you are doing is denying people the right to reach their potential to be positive participants in their societies. Why the hell do you want to make burdens out of people like me on your society when we're perfectly willing, if we can be who we are, please, no harm to you in any particular way so that we can get on with our lives and be as contributing to our societies as any other one of you. But no, you make burdens out of us. No, you cause us huge mental health. No, we end up committing suicide because there seems to be no end. So therefore, Mr Trump, with what you suggested, get fucked. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Stephen, I think I I think I'll finish there. Excuse my language. <laughs> that was remarkable. I think, you know, when I was preparing to ask you questions, I, you know, you had so many achievements, broken so many barriers in life, so many things to ask about, and your talk was fantastic the way it covered it all. Um, so really, thank you. I just want to, because we're limited on time, I'm just going to ask sure. one question before taking yes, a question from the sure. audience. Why do you think it was that New Zealand was such a trailblazer in women's suffrage, in electing a, uh, a transsexual person to a mayoralty, to parliament, to passing civil unions, why was it such a trailblazer in this area? And do you think there's a sort of cultural or social reason? And can I add Hillary climbing Everest with Tenzing? <laughs> Sorry, I just got the connection with the Queen's coronation that year. Um, our isolation has made us, uh, as a country, we're at the other end, of the, uh, the bottom of the world, um, <laughs> below Australia, and. Um, <laughs> but not in rugby. And, um, <laughs> um, and we weren't a convict colony. And so a, um, a sense of, and why did people go and colonise New Zealand, you know, and go to settle in New Zealand from there? They wanted to escape what was happening here. Um, I'm talking class system and things like that. They had a vision of an egalitarian society. And I think the basis of our, what we call number eight wire mentality came to birth at that time. Uh, number eight wire mentality is that, you know, you could make anything out of nothing. A silk purse out of a sow's ear. They went to a brand new country, yes, it had been. And also, uh, you know, the Treaty of Waitangi was a very important thing. Um, a treaty between Māori and Queen Victoria, the Crown. 
over there compared to many other during the imperialization uh, period that happened let's take the Australian Aborigines for example they did not get it as good as we did not that we had it that great we have redress now anyhow that's going into another area probably bore you to death right now um, but there's a general feeling I think in New Zealand of everyone gets a fair go honest day's work honest day's pay um, we brought in a social welfare system, uh, Michael Joseph Savage in the 1930s and all of that. Um, so it's sort of been in New Zealand's blood, if you like, in our DNA. We've had to be inventive. We were so far away from the rest of the world. It was very hard to have commerce and economy building. I think we might have been one of the first countries, if not the first country, to develop refrigerated shipping because we needed to get our produce, agricultural and pastoral, um, over to you here in England and stuff like that until you kicked us out in the 1970s. And, um, <laughs> and that changed the whole... Sorry. These things happen. And, um, and so, yeah, I would just sort of say there's an inner strength, a humbleness, a modesty, um, but a, also a caring. Um, rural folk, like who elected me into office, they'll spot a fake at 50 paces, and they would have spotted that with me if that had been the case. But they didn't see a fake there. They saw someone that had, yeah, but an unusual life. Of course, I might have seen one or two of them down on the street or in Cummins Coffee Lounge from time to time, but we won't go there. Like I used to see the odd public servant when I was sitting on select committee going, oh, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, a girl would never reveal her clients. And, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes politics is a bit like prostitution, really. <laughs> Very fine line. You're both out for some money. You know, you know, one wants to get votes and donations. That's called politics. <laughs> the other just wants the business, baby. And um, <laughs> sorry to be so flippant about it, but you do need to laugh and lighten up a bit and not take themselves so goddamn seriously. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Stephen, I've gone way beyond your question. No, no, I think um, that's, <laughs> that's what we call a comprehensive answer. Yeah. We'll just take one question from the audience before we have to wrap up. Mm. So is there anyone who'd like to... There's a burning question. Please just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Yeah, the, uh, the person over here. Um, you spoke at the start about um, uh, the movement, uh, feminist movement since like women's suffrage. Um, I just wondered what your interaction with the feminist movement has been, whether you think it's been um, inclusive enough coming from a sort of side of it that's not the, the well, mainstream Well, I would feminist. say with the majority of feminists that I've ever come across, We've been, it's been really good. There is an element of radical feminism at the moment that's very anti-transgender rights right now. And I condemn them for that because they seem to be practicing the same things they fought so hard against before. What the hell is this? You know, um, they have a right to say it. They have a right to express it. And I got a right to reply. And, um, you know, and I do in that regard. I uh, see Jermaine Grey is involved with the trans exclusionary radical feminists, and they hate that word, they call it hate speech. Oh, yeah, right, how ironic that is, sweetie. Um, you know, we're not going to give up the fight to have equality and respect and dignity ever. It's too late now, we've come too far. And people like me have done what I've done. You can't tell me that you just erase it. What I think we need to do is to have a genuine discussion with people. Let's understand exactly what your point of view is. What are you terrified of if people, transgender uh, you know, in particular, are allowed to thrive? What is the issue here? Now, if you're going to talk to me about toilets and those sorts of things, I mean, we've got real initiatives happening in our corporate world in New Zealand and our public institutions of being inclusive and they're treading on eggshells because they're getting criticised some, sometimes about things like toilet issues. And what I mean by that is sort of having gender-neutral toilets and, and, and all of those sorts of things. Actually, I find that it's an issue, it's a matter, it's down here on the priority list as far as I'm concerned. There is health, 
there is housing, there is employment, there is surgery, there's all sorts of things that I would actually put up the scale of being an order of importance to be dealing with. Um, feminism is something that has been women's liberation, all of that sort of stuff. Where do you think the rainbow community got some of its modelling from on how to um, you know, have positive um, agitation toward what they see, to have their issues addressed and discussed. We modelled that off some of the um, activities in the 60s and the 70s of the women's movement. And many of what we are, uh, uh, things that we are wanting to go for are not dissimilar, if not the same, as uh, what they want, but from a transgender point of view. So I don't denounce feminism at all. It has done much for the world, and certainly for women, uh, to know who they are to be who they are. Why can't we have the same as a transgender community? Unfortunately, that's all we have time for in terms of questions. But thank you so much for joining us. That was an absolute education. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.